Three, two, one, and we're live. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of the Village Made Podcast. My name is Movel Hemuli. And if this is your first time joining us, please consider subscribing. And if uh, you're returning, please, uh, no, thank you for turning, thank you for tuning in. Um, but uh, also, before we get into this, uh, also check out our sponsors in the description box below. Uh, shout out to C4 and AV Build Utah. Now, let's get into what we're here for. Uh, <laughs> man, it's just exciting. And then finally, you know, able to get you on here and to schedule uh, schedule you in and uh man appreciate the time especially since uh you know this whole covid thing and not mm -hmm. knowing especially what's happening and stuff but thank you for your time and thank you for having me um today we have um a very special guest more I'm sorry, I forgot your last name. It's okay. Salima. Salima. There uh -huh. you go. Sorry, I should have got fine. that before. You're but fine. um yeah, so Mo Salima. Mm -hmm. And um I got to know you because you and my wife work together. Yes. And because of that, you know, I got to know you as well. And uh mm -hmm. just hearing your story and hearing what you do, you know, especially uh, for our Polynesian people. That's why I wanted to have you on. And so um to begin, okay. let's just uh start with the story of your name. Who named you and the meaning of your names? Okay, so my name, my full name is Muamai Marjorie Salima. My first name is Muamai. I go by Mua, really. Um, I am named after my father's mother, who um, died when he was eight years old. So I never got the privilege of meeting my grandmother or getting to know her. And uh, yeah, but I did hear a lot of awesome stories about her. And then my middle name is Marjorie, and I'm named after my father's first cousin, who was like a sister to him. And her name is Marjorie Pearson Silinga, but we affectionately call her Auntie Pili. And so a uh, fun fact about that, um, my mother and my aunt who actually went to high school together in Pongo at uh, Samoana High School before my parents ever met. So I'm sure when I was born, they didn't have no arguments of naming me after her. So. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, Salima? Salima is my dad's um, name, of course, and mm -hmm. it comes from Sapapali'i in Savai'i in, okay. in Samoa. And what village is your mom from or your mother's side? My mom's side, she's actually from, she was born in um, in Fasito'uta in Upolu. And okay. so both of them were born in Samoa, I guess it was formerly called Western Samoa. And they were both were raised in American Samoa. So, wow. so my father, he actually, when, when he, when his mother passed away, he was, he moved to American Samoa. And it was his uncle, Tiave Salima, that actually um, brought him to live with them. And he was, and there is where he was raised with his older brothers, um, Miller Salima and Uncle Paki, uh, Robert Tiave. And the, they lived there until, um, they actually moved to Hawaii and settled in Hawaii. And my uncle's family, from Uncle Paki Tiave, they are still there in the same old house that they were raised in and as in Kalihi. So shout out to the Tiaves. And it's kind of cool too because you um, you have ties to the village or at least my village, yeah, which is like yes. you know, our North Shore. Yes. And everyone knows the Tiaves there. Yes. You know, so and David Tiave. Yeah. Junior and then Jenny, she's married to PC Otto's. Yeah. Right. That's, That's a, cool. <laughs> yeah. We all touched like it somehow. Huh? Yeah. And right. also on the Salima side, right? With, right. Um, oh, I forgot her, uh, the two Yas. Yes. Are you talking about Angie? Yeah, Angie. So, uh, Angie's my. Because they were, yes, you know. She's actually my first cousin that was raised with us. Yeah. So, yeah. That's was, cool. Uh, we do have a lot of relatives out in Hawaii. Yeah. So. Awesome. And for you, um, where were you born and raised? Okay, so my actually my my father when he um, when they actually landed in in Hawaii, um, he was he was soon enlisted in the Marines, and so oh, he yeah. actually um, went. He was deployed immediately after he enlisted to fight in the Korean War. So in the Korean Dang. War is where he was at. But then I think it ended like in 1953 or something, somewhere in the 50s, and so he. He actually was honorably discharged, and then he settled in Redondo Beach, California. And on the other hand, my mother, who was in Upolu at the time, she was a sickly child. So her her mother's sister, I believe her name was Sayina Enesi, took her and cared for her in Tutuila, and that's how she was raised in Utule in American Samoa, and that's where she met my aunt, and they went to school together in Samoana. And then after high school, she eventually um, migrated to California as well. And that's where both my parents met and they got married in San Pedro, California. And that's where me and my five siblings were born. 
So we are California natives, and we were born and raised in L.A. And at, I guess um, being born and raised in L.A. Mm-hmm. at that time, were you one of the only Polynesians at the um, there in wherever you were? Um, so we were raised in... Um, my father used his GI Bill um, to, along when he was in the military, so we pretty much lived in an upscale community in Redondo Beach. And yes, we were the very few minorities that lived there. Um, we were like probably the only someones. We, there were some a few someone families there, and I um, like the the Hanemans, Max and, and Auntie, Uncle oh, yeah. Max and Auntie Moana Hanneman, and then there was Uncle Wayne and Auntie Malama Willis. And then there was the Aswanga family, the Matali family. So there was quite a few that were just right there in Redondo and Hermosa and in Manhattan. But then a lot of our relatives, like my dad's sisters and, and brothers, they lived in Carson and Long Beach and then Compton. So there were a lot. It's just they were not too far from us, but okay. we were that right there. So we, we always had uh, weekends where we could gather together as family. So what was childhood like for you? It was amazing. Like I, um, I only admit it now, but I was my dad's girl, so I was pretty much spoiled growing up. And I'm sure when my siblings watch this, they're gonna say she finally admitted it. But um, growing up, my father was an entertainer when he when he first came to the states, and he was a, a welder by trade. But at night, he was an entertainer, and he was a fire knife dancer. Okay. So he joined a, a Polynesian group in the very small um, community that back then, I think it was back in 63, where they, um, when Disneyland first opened the Tahitian Terrace. And um, my father's dancing group was the first group to actually perform there. So Disneyland to me was like my backyard because every time we had family over, I think that was my dad's claim to fame where he'd always say, hey, you know, I danced here. So we got to go to Disneyland a lot. And then uh, he also performed at Seven Seas, which is a, it was in Hollywood and it was like a nightclub. It was like an island themed nightclub that was really popular back then. And a lot of celebrities would go there to party. And so, and he also was a fine enough dancer there. So he got to do a lot of um, entertainment there as well. And so, yeah. So growing up, I just knew that being someone was pretty special because he was a fine enough dancer and it opened doors to a lot of other things that we were privy to. So Dang, that's it was awesome. Fun. Yeah, a couple of weeks back I um on the podcast I had Rex Tumalu mm-hmm. and his story or his parents' story was just about the same but in Orlando. And so mm-hmm. his dad was a fire knife dancer and they uh when the Disney World started there and so his dad got to you know start the fire knife dancing there. But um yes. yeah, it's kind of cool to, you know, I think it's or for me it's cool to um for people to say that they get to perpetuate the culture yes. through fire knife mm-hmm. in the entertainment business, you know, and make a living from it, right? Yeah, I'm and it sure was that so he much to, fun. Like he, yeah. uh, one thing that he really, really wanted to make sure that we all knew who we were because we were amongst a lot of the Caucasians in our in our little neighborhood there. But uh, it never my identity of knowing that I was someone and I was proud of it. It was never a question to me because in our family we spoke. It was bilingual, so we spoke English to my parents. Our parents spoke someone to us, but it was never uh, a question of who I was uh, and cultural wise. But being American and being born and raised here, it was good to have both cultures. It was a a blessing in disguise sometimes. So and. Um, I guess just being when you were born and raised mm-hmm. or just growing up, what were some of the maybe the the culture that was taught to you or that was passed on to you, whether you liked it or not, I guess, or in some aspects, you know? Um, yeah. So my parents, uh, when we were in Redondo, my parents decided to purchase a, a family store. It was like a little market that catered to Polynesian community. And so they had banana and taro and and like corned beef, like a lot of things that cater to the Polynesian um, um, families. And so they sold their home in Redondo and they purchased a store in Carson. And we, so that was basically, um, it was infused with so many cultures, but the Samoans were the main Polynesians that lived there. And so it was, it was fun because we got to see what the culture was really like. And a lot of the culture, it demands respect. And so what they say goes. And what they say, if you don't see, if you don't um, do it right away or like how they want, we did grow up um, 
by the laying on of hands as well. So it's not like, you know, it was a touch of love pretty much. Right. But yeah, it we were very, very much involved in our culture. My father made sure that we knew that we always loved the elderly, always respect them and always cater to them if they need are in need of help. So that's yeah. awesome. And um just because I know a little bit of your background with the education that you have, uh-huh. was education a, a big push for you guys oh, growing yes. up as yeah. well? Um, my father sacrificed a lot. I think the he didn't want us to uh, follow in his footsteps in the entertainment business. And I don't know why, but we all just wanted to like, can we go to PCC? Can we just go downstairs? <laughs> and he was like, nope. You're gonna go find another route to, you know, get, you know, find a life and get it up, be successful. Now I'm not saying that PCC dancers right. aren't successful. It's just he said that there's more to it to life than just dancing your way through, and which was good. Um, he and my mother both uh, sacrificed a lot. They, we had the store, and then they also had a nonprofit organization that he co-founded with some other a uh, group of other people. And it was called Samarica Incorporated, and it was in Carson. And that was um, a nonprofit organization that provided academic scholarships for Dang. Polynesian kids as well as the minorities. And it catered to everyone and anyone that had good grades and that were willing to have um, a higher education. So you can go to a trade school, and as long as you're doing well, they would provide a scholarship for you. So... Yeah, props to my dad, though, because he was very, very ahead of his time. And so from someone that never had an education, that was one thing that he always wanted us to have. And that was make sure we had an education. It didn't matter what we did in life, but he wanted to make sure we had that that degree in our hand. So that's awesome. And um, I guess for you, when... um, with your with the sacrifices that your mm-hmm. parents made, yeah. and uh, you know, just coming across the ocean or just moving their family to the U.S. Um, with the person that you've become, and you know, the mm-hmm. things that you've accomplished, would you say that they are proud of you? I I'd hope so. I I I think so. Like I would. Um, I think a lot of times I think about them all the time. Like there's this saying by Warren Buffett that kind of like keeps me um, in check. Mm-hmm. And it always, it's like someone, um, someone is sitting under the shade because someone planted oh, yeah. the tree. And I always think about my dad and my mom. <laughs> Don't cry. <laughs> but um, yeah, we stand on the shoulders of a lot of our ancestors mm-hmm. and we want to make them proud. And we want to make them, um, we want to, be successful not only for ourselves but for our family but also for them because they work so hard right. and so yeah yeah i just feel like um like each generation you know they mm-hmm. we just say that we do the best that we could you know and so every generation has made a choice and a decision to like further you know your family mm-hmm. and so your parents choice and decision was to move you know from Samoa to the states right and then now for you your decision was to you know get a education right and to you know further you know the family moving forward and so um which just transitions perfectly into what we're going to talk about, which is your, you know, what you got your, you know, what you went to school for, uh-huh. and with your education, and then also how you're helping, you know, with how that that school translates into helping people, sure. and uh, yeah. So can you talk about um, your education sure. and what you went to school for? So I graduated from Carson High. Uh, we, even though we lived in a whole different city, we actually used my my auntie's address so we can all go with our relatives to to Carson. After Carson High, um, I had a scholarship to go to um, UCLA, my school of choice. And I really, I, that was my dream. I wanted to go. Um, I only had a partial scholarship. but So my father said, oh, if you can just give me another year and then you can go away for school because I wanted to go away. I didn't want to stay. So I went to Cal State Long Beach. And, um, and it was nice there because he said, Go and figure out what you want to do, get your major, and then come back and tell me. And so I think it was like the first week. I was so excited to go and walk into this arts, uh, the liberal arts building. And I see this big old, big old poster about photography. And I was so excited to go home and tell my dad, hey, I found my major. <laughs> and he just, he quickly shot that one down and told me, eh, that is not 
the major. You can do that anytime. Go back and find another one. So I actually majored in my next uh, thing was I love math. And so um, I'm really good in math. And I thought, oh, computer science is probably the best for me. I like that. I like computer science. So I majored in there. And I had the grades enough to, t and I said, Dad, I think I'm ready to go to UCLA now. And he said, oh, you want to go to school at UCLA? And I said, heck yeah, I didn't work for this hard to get there. And, and he said, all right, if you want to go away for school, you got to go to where your, your older brothers are. And that's Alvin and Alex. And they were attending BYU here in Provo. And I just, I, I think I was so devastated. I'm like, what? I'm not going to BYU. And in my heart, it was never BYU. It was always UCLA. And so um, I cried and I told my mom and she said, uh, you have a choice. You either stay here and just continue school here or go away for school and go to BYU where your brothers are. And so I reluctantly took the time to go to BYU. And I majored in computer science at the time. And so um, my brothers were very, very, I was fortunate to have my brothers here because they pretty much did everything for me. Uh, they actually got my room all set up by the time I moved here. I had newfound friends, um, and they were um, my dearest friends even now. And I didn't even know, believe it or not, I didn't even know what Tongans were. <laughs> I remember I this, remember, yeah. I didn't know what Tongans were. And I walk in, and I'm like thinking, my roommates were Samoans, you know? I didn't know the difference. I just thought all polys were Samoans. And it wasn't until I came here to Utah that I figured out, okay, something's different. We go to an occasion and they wear that, is it the Kavala? The, yeah. <laughs> so they're wearing that. I said, what is that? And, you know, of course, they had to teach me all their culture. And, I, and uh, I, I'm i not ashamed to say that I learned a lot because a lot of my dearest friends are Tongans. And um, I even have a sister-in-law that's Tongan in there. I love them to death. I love them. I adore them. So anyways, when we were at school, um, my dad became ill, and he, and he told me and my brothers, I need one of you guys to go into the medical field. And I figured, well, one of these guys can do it. And, uh, and he got really sick, and I remember him having diabetes. And he was like, every time he ate something he knew he wasn't supposed to eat, he'd go shoot himself up with uh, the <laughs> insulin. And I'm just like, are you supposed to do that, Dad? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I didn't know that at the time that he was misusing it, and it was, it was, it was wrong. But uh, my older brother, Alvin, had returned home, and so he had to help the family because there's a, us two coming to school. So right. he went back home, so he couldn't major in anything. And so it was just me and my other brother, so my brother went into, Alex went into radiology, and uh, my, bro, my dad kept saying, you need to go into nursing. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Okay, whatever. And I still kind of like, like, all right, I will, but I never did. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the time came when I wanted to go on a mission, and I was of age to go on a mission. And he said, I, when I told him the first time, he's like, no, the mission's not for you. You go finish your school. Right. That's what you're here for. You, you finish school. Uh, the, your brothers can go on a mission. And I and I thought about it, and I was like, no, because that was my goal in life, was to just go. And I wanted to serve a church mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so he was just like, can you just finish school first and do this? And I, and you know how when you, when you really feel the spirit that you want to go, you yeah. have to go, right? So the that year that I told him I was going, I actually did my papers here, and he didn't know. And I went, we went back and um, for Christmas, and I told a lot of my football friends that were here, uh, y'all need to help me take my stuff back. And uh, so I kind of snuck all my stuff back into the house without them knowing. And by the time Christmas was over, I was still there waiting for my call. It was already submitted. And he said, what are you doing here? You should be gone already. And I said, no, um, Dad, I'm just... Uh, I told you already I was going to go on a mission, and he was so mad at me, so very disappointed because it felt like his dream just were shattered for me. Right. And I, t I promised him that I would um, finish school if he just let me go on my mission. And so from December to February till I got my calling, anytime someone would come to the store and say, hey, Mo, what are you doing here? Shouldn't you be in school? He'd be the first one to yell, hey, she failed. <laughs> Don't worry about her. Of she course. failed. She just, oh. And I was just like, oh, dad, really? But um, 
the day that my mission call did come, it came through the mail. And, you know, today we uh, have this big old party of like, right. opening it. Back then it wasn't like that. It just came in the mail. My mom came walking in the store one day and she said, here's your mission call. Go open it with your dad. And I was like, what? He goes, go open it with your dad. And so I walked to the back of the office and he was busy doing his work. And I, I kind of like tossed it. I tossed the calling to him and I said, dad. Um, there's my calling. And he goes, well, what calling is that? And I told him and uh, he opened it and he never ever showed any kind of support until that day when he opened it. And he was like crying and saying, you really want to go on a mission? I was thinking, oh, I wasn't like getting all this. <laughs> right. you know, he was chastising me for, for not going to school, but that's how important school was to him. He really wanted us to succeed and so I knew right there I was like I promise you I'll finish school if you let me go on my mission so and it was a blessing too because he was going through a lot at the time so I knew that uh going on a mission was going to help him when I came back from my mission he was just like really sick and I was like okay how can I do this? Like, how can I help my dad and, and my family? Because he kept saying, one of you guys got to go and please, got, you know, to help the family. So I switched my major and I went from computer science to nursing. And uh, my father died before I can even get my nursing degree. Mm -hmm. But because I had my nursing degree, it really, really helped the rest of my family. It helped my mom and it helped a lot of my brothers and sisters uh, and extended family as well. But because he lit the fire and he's like, one of you guys got to go, um, it was good because I had a purpose and I, I knew that that was what I needed to do was going to nursing. So yeah, and um, I've been in nursing for almost 25 years now. And the last eight years, I was actually, uh, given an opportunity to go into something that's called nursing informatics. And it's actually a combination of computer and <laughs> nursing. And Which so, is perfectly uh, what you want to And it was just up my lane. I was like, what? So in, in essence, it came full circle. Right. And so now I, I loved it so much, I went and got my master's degree in, um, in this field. And, and right now I love it so much, it's just like, Thanks, Dad. I didn't know that there was such a thing like this, uh, but it was good because it, I I can help my family as well as satisfy my my needs. Like I love um, computers and I love math, and it's just it was great. Like it was just fused into one role, so that was perfect. Man, what so <laughs> with your dad? Whether it was like foresight or whether it was just like you know him living through you, you know living vicariously through mm -hmm. you, whatever it was, you know it just like you said, like you mentioned, is just the perfect combination, right? right. Coming back full circle, mm -hmm. and uh, for you know, I guess for me, I would just be like, hey, that's the spirit, you know, talking through him. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. That's not what you felt at the time, you know. Like, <laughs> no, Dad, I don't want to do. <laughs> no, I don't want to do nursing, was, but you know. I mean, I, I could see that there's the struggle, the challenges that if all our families, like even the in Polynesians as a whole, that's the last thing we want to we want to ever do is go to the hospital yeah. or go seek medical attention because we're all just so strong and we always wait to the last minute when we are in dire need and it's an emergency and then we all want to go and then when we go they're saying well why didn't you come earlier now it's too late like now you have to have dialysis or now you have to have kidney transplant or all this stuff but in reality we need to take be more careful and be more mindful of our health because there are some preventative measures that we can take right. before we get it, before it gets worse. And we just don't know that. And a, a lot of our family members just, they're just used to taking care of themselves. So, yeah. That's yeah. crazy that you talk about that. And then also, just speaking of like as a Samoan, you know, mm -hmm. and a female on top of that, are there many in your, that work in what you do? And do you feel like you're like a trailblazer, I guess, you know, to, in the sense of, in the field that you're in? Uh, so here in Utah, I, I think there's a handful of us. I don't know if there are many of us, but when I do hear a name and I know it's Polynesian, oh, I'm just like, oh yes, we have more. And I, I always um, props to them because this field is not easy. It's really not easy. But if you have the passion to serve others, this is a great field to be in. And I do remember when I was in school, I was just like, okay, really? 
Dad, really, this is what you want me to do? And it just grew on me because when you do your clinics and your clinicals and you, you're serving others, it just really makes you, when they're happy and when they get better, you see the progress that you help them make. And it just gives you that satisfaction that, oh, I made a difference in someone's life. So, but it was just like, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the love we have for each other and for right. family because he was the one that initiated it. But no, I love it so much. I don't ever want to let it go. And that's just how it is. And my mom, she was ill at times too. And she was the one I could care for because she was still alive at the time. And and the other job that I have is was because of her. She lived in Las Vegas and I'm here in Utah. And she was sick as well, and she kept calling me because I'm the nurse in the family, so she'd always say, I need you to come. So I would always drive, and and I'm telling her, Mom, really? I can't do that. So I That's actually, like a 10-hour yeah. round trip, right? So Down I reached to out to one of my cousins who um, who worked for the airlines and asked her if there's any openings because I really need help to get to my mom when she needs me. And so I got a part-time job there as well and it was just so convenient for me to just jump on a plane and go take care of my mom when i needed to but then she passed away five years later after i got that job and i loved that job so much i kept it <laughs> yeah talk about that how long have you been oh, with that job or with um, both jobs i guess for that job i've been there for 19 years Wow. and i that is my ticket to the world yeah. and i would never let it go because uh i met so many people there and that's like my family I don't Including have a social life, life yes, <laughs> right? and your wife. Yeah. I love Val. Uh, she's, uh, yeah, her and a lot of other Polynesians that are, they're my family. And it's uh, one fun uh, experience that I wanted to share was when a lot of, there's, uh, there's a lot of Tongan guys there, right? And some ones as well. And there's a, they become my family, they're like my brothers. And every time they have medical questions, they'll come and ask me. And a lot of times, um, They'll be shy to uh, tell me because a lot of times it's personal stuff. Right. But they are like, <laughs> they realize that I'm a nurse and I can say it because we can talk. And and it's become so fun with them because every time they have medical stuff, they all they always come and say, hey, I have a question. Can you do this? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, come. Let's talk about it. But I love that I can use that, my experience in the, in the medical field, and use it at my other job as well. So yeah. It's been a blessing for, for me to have two awesome jobs. Um, a story that I heard, I mean, that you had mentioned, you mm -hmm. know, and just in us talking stories was um, because he's my dad, one of my dad's good friends. Yeah. I was talking about um, uh, Ofa Hengawe. Yeah. Um, dang, what's his name? Um, who's the one? Leo. That, Leo, yeah. Was it Leo? So, <clears throat> yeah. Yes. I, I just mentioned, you know, I mean, the the story that you told about uh -huh. Leo and working at the airport and you being able to use your, you know, yes. your nursing skills yeah, um, while, you know, whatever was happening on the airport. But you don't have to go into the into the full detail. But I think that's a cool story that highlights, you know, using your skills to help our Polynesian people, yeah, which is yeah. kind of like the story that you mentioned already, you know. But yeah, what was that? Uh, yeah. How, how was that for you? Especially because very, uh, you talk about family, right? Mm -hmm. That's like a family to you. He was like an older brother. We we took the late uh, shift. So I always see Leo. Um, he's one hardworking man. Like he worked from morning till night. And I would come in at seven in the afternoon or in the evening and work with him all the way till 1.30. Well, one evening I come and um, he was in the lunch break having his lunch break as usual, and I came in and had my dinner because once I go out there, there is no break for me. I work all the way till 1.30. And so he kind of, we teased each other. He kind of told me, hey, we're on the same pier again. And I said, fine. And Pier 11 was always that busy, been like full on luggage is coming every second. So he told me, okay, well, I'll just meet you at 10 o'clock. And I said, I'll meet you at 10. So we went to our stations and he was on Pier 5 and I was on the inbound side where all the bags come and you just toss it on the belt, on the uh, conveyor belt so it can go outside. And I wasn't even shortly after, probably 30 minutes uh, later, uh, someone came, drove up at, at the, at the uh, where I was and said, hey, are you a nurse? And I said, yes. And he said, Leo is down. And I said, Leo is down. He said, Leo is down. And all I could think of was Leo. So uh, when I got there, he was already being um, given CPR from with two cops there. And so I was able to jump in and, and help them. 
Um, unfortunately, he didn't make it. And so that in itself was um, a traumatic experience to a lot of our Polynesian family that was there and got to witness it. And so um, it was nice because, you know, and as a nurse, you see things and you just get used to it. Right. But um, then I forget that other people don't see it. And so when Leo passed away, it was more of a, a shock to everyone there. But for me, it was just my adrenaline. My nursing skills just just like dropped in. And, and, um, and I was just able to coordinate what the whole process of them seeing him the way he was, the way they left him. And when the ambulance came, it was more of a, oh, let's just put him in the bag and just take him. And I looked at them and just seeing the eyes of all of our Polynesian family, brothers and sisters watching that, I yelled over to the um, ambulance guy and told him, I just told him, stop, you don't do that. And he's like, why? And I said, don't do that because you want him to leave with dignity, right? And so right. I, I yelled at him and said, you go in that ambulance, you get that gurney. You put him on the gurney and then put the white sheet over him. But don't you come over here and put, try to put him in the black bag. That's not right. It's so right. wrong, the, the body bag. But I was able to help in that way. And it was just so nice because um, I don't think that I would have been able to help that way if I didn't have the skills for it. And just to see the family and, and how appreciative they were that evening, that they were able to see their, their father, their husband, their brother right. before they took him to the morgue. Because usually after something happens on site, the medical examiner will come first, and then they take him immediately to the morgue. And there's no way they can, the family can see him while he's still, still you know, young. warm, his body's warm. And so I told the people there, Oh, if you want to write here, then go ahead and, and just take him. But I'm going to tell you right now, his family's on their way, and we need to see him because in our culture, you have to have a warm body. You need a touch of warm <laughs> body, and there's not, nothing. I mean, you can't see them at the morgue. It's just not the way to do it. And so I know the two cops that were there were so helpful. They were the ones that orchestrated that whole meeting of the family getting to see the, to see Leo before they took him to the, mor the morgue, so, or the mortuary. So, and I was glad to be a part of it. I just, I thanked him at the end. I was just so, exa I was exhausted right. after when they all left. I just went to the car and just let it all out. And I was just like, immediately called my siblings and told them, oh, I just got to tell you something. Life is too <laughs> short. I just love you all. And they're like, something happened to you. But it was just a great experience. It was great to be there for him. Right. And I, I'll never forget that. So. Man, that's amazing that you could, you know, just in showcasing that you can use your, your skills, you know, from the yeah. nursing to help mm -hmm. in your other job. Right. But also to help our own Polynesian people mm -hmm. and, you know, just him living, leaving in dignity. Right. But um, and also working in the hospital. How has that, you know, coming in contact with our Polynesian people there? You know, does that uh, give you more incentive? Not incentive, but like, does that do you want to offer more help or, you know, does it um, just because, you, you know, it's your Polynesian people or is that something that you just offer for everyone in general? So I actually treat everyone as if they're my own family, like to my mom or my dad or my brother, my sister. Um, but I just have a, 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 a special kinship when when you see a Polynesian person come in. So for nine years of my nursing, I was in surgery. And so um, I actually was charging. I uh, was over the, the whole OR. And a lot of nurses and a lot of people already know that when a Polynesian comes through, it's Mua's peeps. They always <laughs> say, oh, Mua, your peeps are here. I'm like, OK. And I'll go, I'll go there and meet with them yeah. before they go in. And so I just want them to be calm and just make, let them know that, hey, it's going to be OK. You know, like just to touch them. And, and it's so funny because when I'll go over there and say who I am, they always go like this. You must be Tongan. And I'll always tell them, yes, <laughs> I am. And then make them feel good and make them feel at ease. And, and you know, they could trust you that, oh, okay. And you could see that, that anxiety. They, they have so much relief and that I'm taking them in. And I don't stay in there, but it's just to let them know, hey, there's someone there that's thinking of you and paying for you. And then even if someone's do the same thing, oh, you must be someone else. I, I am. Be like, I'll, I am <laughs> I'm whatever, whatever you yeah. want me to be, even if you're Fijian or like just to let them know that, you know what, you have a sister here that that's uh, praying for you on the outside and I'll do all I can to advocate for you while you're here. But it's just nice to know that 
I am at a level where I can actually go and help our own people when they are when they're in need. So that's yeah. awesome. Um, I remember you also men- also mentioning the story of. Um, I think it was when you were in the OR and then somebody said, I recognize your voice oh, or something. I don't yeah. remember the, the exact story, but do you remember that? Yes. You remember? So Can you I, share that with yes. us? Yes. Um, I was actually working at the airport. And, oh, okay. There and, it is. Um, for one summer, I, I'm usually at the ramp. I work at the ramp with everyone. But one summer, they, they needed help at the front, at the ticket counter, and you were mainly a pointer. You just point and say, oh, you got how many bags? Oh, go drop your bags over there. So uh, one time there was this, um, I was just helping someone at the kiosk, and it was like the very end of the kiosk, it was like maybe four terminals. I was at one end helping one person, and this lady just comes out of nowhere, and she comes and says, excuse me, but um, my son who's over there thinks that he knows you. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, can you hold on? So she just kept looking and she, I kept looking over to the boy that she pointed at and he kept smiling at me and I said, okay, um, what makes you think he knows me? <laughs> and then she said, well, she said, though well, he says he claims it's you, but this is not the job he knows you at. And I said, well, what do you think it is? And he said, she said, he said that you 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 were his nurse in the OR, and I said, "What?" And then she said, "Are you a nurse by chance?" And I said, "I am." And then she said, "He said that you were his nurse." And I said, "Oh, actually, I am, and I actually work at." Um, and he it was the exact day, the exact place that he said, and I said, "Yes, I was his nurse." And he comes running to me, and he goes, "Cause she like looked and nodded. It is. It's her." And then he says, "I knew it was you. I heard your voice <laughs> from the other end of the of the term of of the kiosk, and it was you because it was your voice that re- it reminded me of you." So, I I felt so good when he said that. I was like, "Man, this little kid. He's like mm-hmm. an eighteen year old and came stuff." But it was just something that I'll never forget. Like to come to the airport and then he knew me Recognize because your voice, he yeah. recognized me as a nurse, but I wasn't in, I was in the uniform of the airport <laughs> and he says, no, it was your voice. And I'm right. like, wow, that was really, that was cool. I, it made my day that night or that day. Dang, so, that's, yeah, I, that thank was a you cool for letting story. Me share that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then can you get into like with what you're doing now, I guess the past eight years you've been into it? Okay. Um, with information. Oh, so it's called nursing informatics, yeah. and what we deal with is all the applications that all the clinicians use in the hospital, all the uh, apl- the software applications that you know you see on the terminals, like um, nursing documentation, doctors' documentation, everything that we do or that they use at the at the hospital, we get to be part of. So That's cool. a certain department. If you, um, it doesn't work, the, the workflow doesn't work with this computer program that we have. So we have this uh, electronic health record system that it was pretty, pretty new. It's not as new as before, but it's probably almost five years old now. And it's been um, still, in, we're still trying to improve it and work everyone's um, so that it will work for everyone. And like the ER, you can't just give them the same program that the ICU uses because it's two different right. workflows. And so we got to make sure that what um, these guys need in their unit, like the ICU, accommodates them. So we just got to make sure their workflow is, is good and that the computer does what it's supposed to do for them. So it was really That's nice cool. because as a clinician, you bring all that background and experience and like, yes, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Because when I'm in the OR, I want to make sure I do this, this, and this. And I want the computer to be able to do what it says it will do. So so that's what nursing informatics pretty much is. Dang. It's fun. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And then you said you got your master's in that as well? Yes. That's I, cool. I loved it so much. I found right. my niche. And, and I thought, oh, you know what? Go get your master's. In, and it... Um, that in itself is a blessing because I never thought I would go do it, uh, but I know that it, it it will help me in the future, and it has it has really blessed me because there's uh, opportunities within nursing, and there's so much of it, and I didn't know until I got my degree that there's doors that just open, and you have you have the option now. You get to choose what you want. It's not so much oh I'm limited. I can only do this. No, but when you have that degree in your hand, that's your ticket. It, it it opens doors of opportunities so much. Right. So, and um, just um, on the podcast, I had um, 
Jeez, now I forgot her name. <laughs> um, you had so many. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, she's a lost in now. Um, Tema. Tema, yeah. Yes. So Tema, sorry. Tema, Tema. my bad. <laughs> but Tema. Um, when Tema was on the podcast, she had mentioned that her dad mm-hmm. uh, had, you know, had always uh, told them or told her, his kids, that education will be the salvation for his people. Right. And so that and just kind of so reminds true. me of what you're saying. It's so true what she said. Like, I, I've actually watched Tema's um, interview, and a lot of what she said is true. Education is the key to knowledge and yeah. and when you know so much you want to share it as well and you don't want to just like keep it so a lot of times when i see our own people our own family and they don't understand a certain medical ailment or something i'll take time to teach them and say hey look this is based on what i know and this is what you should do like i'll just give them advice and say okay i think you should kind of like lean this way yeah, right. and do this i don't tell them what to do i just kind of share what i know so yeah Dang, that's awesome. And um, I guess kind of because we're in this pandemic with the COVID uh-huh. and especially here in Utah, there's, you know, our, our Polynesian people are being affected the most here, you right. know, in the minority category, I guess. Um, just working in the hospital and working, you know, with our Polynesian people, is there something that we can do? Or do you know, like, I don't know, just what are your thoughts and ideas or anything uh-huh. like uh, opinions on you know, this whole COVID and Polynesians and, you know, what we can do to to better, you know, better ourselves because this is actually happening at a fast and a rapid rate, right? Oh, it is. So, yeah, so right now, um, they pull, there's, there's such a surge in this coronavirus pandemic that um, people are not, they're getting... Um, they're getting coronavirus fatigue where they they don't want to be quarantined anymore. Mm. So a lot of them are coming out and they're rebelling and they don't want to they don't want to wear the mask. They don't want to take the guide. They don't want to adhere to the guidelines that the government is saying or even their spiritual leaders are saying. But I feel like um, the coronavirus is we're done with it, but it's not done with us. Right. And so if we want to move forward, we have to. Um, do our homework. So like when we talked before, you said that there's so much information, a lot of misinformation out there on TV, on social media, on the news even. And we all just have to take it, like do your own homework, decide what's best for you and your family, and then follow through. But don't wait for someone to tell you, oh, yeah, the pandemic <laughs> virus stuff, is, it's done. It's like the coronavirus is done. It's over. And then you go out there and you just kind of live life like it's it's never happened. And a lot of people say it's a conspiracy. A lot of people say that this is this is it. It's only seasonal. But no, coronavirus is not, it's not going to be gone for a while. And so what we have to do is make sure that we adhere to the guidelines that they are actually the CDC and FDA are um, giving out. And I know it's hard. I know a lot of people are saying, we don't trust them. We don't We don't want to because, I mean, they're taking our constitutional rights away. And if I don't want to wear a mask, I'm not going to wear it. I get that. We wear masks all the time in the OR. So I know what it's like. And But if you care for family around you that are like in our family, like you just mentioned, the Polynesians are very at high risk. Like just recently, it like spiked up big time for us Polynesians. And I personally feel that um, we get it a lot because we're very affectionate people. We're always like embracing each other. We just throw like, we get like kiss them all over and we just want to hug them or hug each other. And um, I think what we're missing out as well is we also are known for, we're prone to diabetes, heart disease, and kidney failure. Mm-hmm. So of those three, we have those three against us. But also, a lot of us, um, we experience obesity. And I, I, for one, am challenged by that too. But because we have these co- comorbidities, which is also underlying issues that come with it, when you get this illness and you have it, it's a respiratory one. So because you have that, your chances of being very sick is it gets it's compounded with this virus. So like, for example, I have two, I have a cousin who's in who's in the ICU right now. I think he's like in, he's 60. 
probably in his almost wow. close to 60. He's in the ICU. But then I have an aunt who was 75. And she wasn't taken to the ICU. They were both in the ER. One of them got to go. To the, he was admitted. And then my aunt, who's 75, was not admitted. And it's because of that respiratory illness that they have. So if you have shortness of breath and you know you cannot handle without breathing, they're going to take you in. So my, it, it all depends what you have and what diseases you might have already. So pre-existing conditions really play a factor into if you get the pan, um, the coronavirus. Right. So like right now, I currently um, I'm helping the coronavirus hotline for Intermountain. And a lot of them, a lot of the calls that come in are based on fear because they've been exposed to someone. And the first question I asked them is, okay, so have you been con came in contact with them? And I said, yes, and I feel like I need to do it now because, you know, I'm scared and I don't know the process. And so you have to talk to them and let them understand that you just because you've been exposed to that person, you came in contact with that person for that, for, you know, that day, you have to wait for seven days to see if those symptoms do right. come. And uh, the virus has to replicate so much in your body for it to manifest those, sy those symptoms. And then you can say, okay, let me go get the test. Because if you get tested um, too soon, you might get a false negative result. True. And then you're like, it's a useless test because, you know, like, you don't. You didn't have it in the first place. But those who have it and are asymptomatic and they feel like they, you know, okay, I have it, but I'm asymptomatic, that doesn't mean you get to go outside and play. That means please follow the guidelines. You know, do your isolation. Do what you can to stay home and self-quarantine. Do, like, there's so much you can do to help separate or isolate yourself from those who are, are not affected by this. And a lot of them... And I don't, I shouldn't say a lot of them, but a few of them are, um, they feel like they're invincible, right? Especially the young ones. And I'm not just saying that because I have a nephew who had it. And of course he had only a few of the symptoms, oh, but wow. he was young and he recovered it fast. He recovered fast. Mm -hmm. Where I have my, my other, I have a sister who, who's also there and she, she's day by day, it, it changes because she's having a hard time breathing and she's in the ICU right now. So, uh, what I can tell you and I recommend is that you you do your homework and don't believe everything that you hear on the news. Please don't, because there's so many doctors out there. There's this medication um, that's used for lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and as well as malaria, and it's called hydrochloric. Hydro Hydrochloroquine. <laughs> Sorry. So that... That is used to treat these three, but um, I feel like the government or, you know, CDC and uh, Dr. Fauci and all of them are not, they don't want to say that it's a cure for that, for coronavirus because they don't have enough data to back it up. But there are some physicians that use it and right. they say, and they claim that it is working for a lot of their patients and they're going to continue to, to uh, use it. But there's a lot of states here, like our state, we can't use it for that purpose. And so... Just do what you can do. And I really like the, um, what our spiritual leaders are saying to us is just stay in the boat. You know that it's dangerous. Just stay in the boat. Like, you know, the rapids are dangerous out there. You don't want to just jump off and say, oh, I can handle. And then you just jump off because later, later on you're going to have to be rescued. But just stay in there and just wear your vest and then just hold on. We're here, like for this coronavirus, I would say stay the course wear the mask and just go with the flow and and you know who you can count on just ask the lord to help you pull you through this stuff because it's very challenging and and i think for our polynesian people were a little stubborn right at mm -hmm. times and so there's a lot of people jumping off the boat you know yeah. and a lot of people who are not staying in the boat but you know at the end of the day it's just because we enjoy being around other people and we're not uh exactly. too we're not too fond of being social distancing right and, and, it's, and it has it happens to a lot of other people and I think it's because the test is available to anyone and everyone now that when we had that surge with Polynesians right. it went with not just us but there was all the other minority groups like Latinos and Native Americans so I think we're all in the same boat together and I just feel like we all just need to be mindful of each other be kind to one another and for the love just for the love wear it right yeah 
I swear it. Yeah, and then I I really liked what the nurses. Uh, there was like a picture circulating a couple of weeks or you know maybe a couple of months back, talking about the nurses like stay home so we can treat you guys you know or uh-huh. because you guys are staying home we're here to treat you or know, yeah help I gotta around. give it to the frontline workers yeah, the front because line. props to them because they they're the ones that are getting burned out and they're the ones that see it all every day and so. If you have anyone in the medical field that's on the front line, you know, if you care about them and you see them doing their stuff, if you know, if they ask you to put the the mask on, put it on. Social distance is one of the greatest things you can do, but I I would implore you to please put the mask on because it does help protect you and the ones you love. So Amen. Well, that's cool. And then um uh I guess just to Wait, do we have anything else? No. Well, just to end, <laughs> we're going to, uh, I have a few questions, you know, just to get to know you a little bit better. And then, so just whatever the, whatever comes to mind, okay. we'll go ahead and answer that. But what takes up too much of your time? I would say work. Right now, I, I took a leave from my other job, so I'm I'm enjoying every minute of it. But it's usually my my two jobs. Okay. Uh, what do you wish you knew more about? Um, financial investments. What or who inspires you? So a quick story. This morning I woke up and I was browsing through Instagram. Or Insta- is it Insta- yeah, Instagram? And um, I was just admiring all the black and white photos of all these women who are being empowered by mm-hmm. other women, right? So I came across uh, Adi Tuisavura's page. Yeah. I believe it was Rising, Rising King, King Media. Media. Yeah. And uh, there was a story about a young woman who was um, sharing her journey of overcoming her addiction to pornography. Yeah. Wasn't that name, powerful? Oh, my gosh. That and, was so powerful. And her, like the courage, you know, and no, strength it, to share her story. It was not only powerful. It was like so honest. That, that was her, her. That was her truth, was her yep. story. And it was... And to this, like, once I, I listened to the whole thing, I was just so in awe with her transparency. Like, she was all in, and she wanted to help others just by sharing her story. And that was that was an inspiration. And if we can clone her husband, too, because her <laughs> right? husband, oh, is so dedicated. And so you can see that love and devotion he has yeah. to help her through her challenges. And, and I'm sure he had their ups and downs, but together they were able to, like, you know, like not so much. Well, they conquered it, but I know it's an, it's, it's still it's a work ongoing, in progress, yeah. right? So, yeah, shout out to Sala Toilupe, I think is her yeah. name. If you think you'd only have affected one person, you affected so many. And I'm sure um, your story is going to go go far. It's going to yeah. help a lot of people. So, yeah. And it's been, well, just going off of that, uh-huh. especially because in her having the courage to share her story there's going to be other people like because people think oh i'm the only one struggling with this or i'm the only one going through it but for her to share her story like oh she can do you know if she's not not only conquered or you know not she's not struggling with it anymore but i can as well and at least she has the tools to help yeah you know like deal with it it was just so amazing i loved her story that's cool so So, shout out rising king so yeah she is an inspiration to to me today Awesome. Um, what are some things you had to unlearn? Um, having high expectations of others, like uh, my brothers and sisters. Uh, for me, uh, they wouldn't. I'm the one that would always see black and white. Right. I was I'm like, you, you got to do right. So I was daddy's girl. And so I always wanted to make him happy. I wanted to make sure that whatever he had planned for me, I would do it. So um, I have younger brothers and sisters that... Uh, they kind of got away with a lot because they were younger. My parents were older, and they kind of like, okay, they were tired of it, of raising us uh, with the with the fist or the hand. So right. they got away with a lot. But a lot of times, I would think that they uh, they don't try as hard as they should. And so I do remember how we had a falling out, and I was yelling at them, and I was telling them, you know what? Feels like we never grew up in the same home. Like, what the heck? Like, where did you guys come from? And I realized my one brother had to tell me, it's like we're running a race and we're all going to the same finish line, but you're way up there and we're way <laughs> down here. And 
you got to let us run our race. And so just by him saying that, it just made me realize that I can't always protect them. I can't always go and hover over them and like grab them and pull them <laughs> right. to where I'm at because it's their race, it's their journey. And I have to, I have to respect that. And so my expectations for them, well, um, it had to kind of like, okay, you need a chill girl because it's their life. And I'm just there always for them. You know, they got to ask for it. So that's powerful. Yeah, man. That's the one thing I have to unlearn. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's your favorite book? Um, my favorite book is always and always has been the Book of Mormon because it's a constant in my life. But um, there's a lot of motivational books that I love to read. And the last uh, book was Michelle Obama's oh, Becoming. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm reading a book called 5 a.m. Club. And it's like to own your mornings and try to take control of it. And what's really nice is you you actually can be so productive from five to eight. And right. a lot of that, a lot of stuff can be done between those hours. And so you asked me why I'm tired. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, because you know, I'm trying to do that. I'm yeah. trying to see what I can do to to own my mornings. Awesome. So, Dang, yeah. that's cool. Um, if you could spend a day with someone dead or alive to pick their brains. Who would it be? It would definitely be my parents. I wish there was like a, a day pass from heaven. Right. And they can come down and hang out with us and we'd have a big old family reunion and, and let them see their grandchildren and, and just enjoy the fruits of their labor. That's what I really want them to see is like what they did for us kids. And I just want them to see, oh, and, and you know, like be proud of what they did for us. So, yeah, yeah. it would be them. Um, What's special about the place you grew up? LA, it's uh, the melting pot of diversity. I, uh, we, it's so diverse in culture and religion and opportunities, mm -hmm. especially entertainment. Like there was never a dull moment there. It's a, it was a wonderful place to grow up in. What have you only recently formed an opinion about? Hiking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's something I never, we never knew what hiking was about. <laughs> well, um, this pandemic was actually a blessing in disguise because because I took the lead of the other job, right. I had so much time on my hands in the evenings. And so I'm not one to stay home. I'm always out and about. And so it actually kicked me out to go walking first. And then I thought, oh, and I live up in uh, where there's so many trails. Right. So I love that. But then I thought, I thought, no, I want to go hiking now. And so I was able to go hiking and, and man, but there's so much of nature in Utah that I haven't discovered yet. So I need to go out and explore. But hiking would be the, the thing. Awesome. Isn't there something about being in nature that oh. just like so like calming? And, and it's so therapeutic. Like, yeah, refreshing, I just love right? it. It's therapeutic for me. Um, what song will guarantee to make you dance? The Cupid Shuffle. <laughs> for the old and the new like you know we always have those yeah. events oh as soon as that song comes up everybody gets up it don't matter how old you are everyone's doing it right uh what's the luckiest thing that's happened to you um being born of goodly parents and having them teach us the how to love unconditionally yeah uh what are you most looking forward to in the next 10 years um having my house paid off and being able to travel the world. Uh, what could you give a 40 minute presentation on with no preparation? Uh, that would definitely be sharing my testimony of Jesus Christ and um, my relationship with him. I love him. Like he is my, he's my go-to guy. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I would easily have 40 minutes of just talking about all the tender mercies and how he showed up in my life. Dang, that's awesome. Uh, what hobby would you get into if time and money weren't an issue? Definitely photography. I would do that. Go nature and photography, right? <laughs> <laughs> While you're hiking. <laughs> when people come to you for help, what do they usually need help with? Um, medical advice and uh, like what doctor to go to for certain things. Yeah. What do you think everyone should do at least once in their life? I thought about that question for a, a bit <laughs> and... Uh, I would say go out and buy flowers for someone that you love and adore and care for. And I know in this time and age, we don't usually connect with people physically or personally, but 
because of social media, you just like da da like that. But right. I think you should go out and buy flowers and give it to them while they're alive and not wait till they're dead because you they deserve to know how much they're loved and how much you care for them. True. Um, which of your scars has the best story behind it? Um, it would be the scar on my eyebrow. I had a um, I had a really bad bike accident on my mission, and I face planted, and uh, this whole side of my face was peeled. The skin was peeled off, and I had this in my lip, and I lost a couple of teeth from it. And so, yeah, it was two months before my mission. I I got into this bike accident. I begged my mission president to please let me not stay. send you home <laughs> let me stay so i can finish it out and he was so gracious to keep me on there but it got me through a lot of doors yeah. you know what happened to you <laughs> yeah oh, they're like geez, well, so you let me in and i'll happened? tell you <laughs> <laughs> that's cool where'd you serve i served in montevideo uruguay oh yeah mission spanish speaking cool so, yes does that help you with the working in the hospital as well spanish it did i i don't use it as as much as i should but oh. there was a lot of times when i did use it to help um our spanish speaking patients it was fun nice and finally if you could give back to your village how or what would you do i'd probably uh, wait till i retire from here and then i go and volunteer to serve our our people in, in Samoa. So I currently have a brother, shout out to my brother yeah. Junior, who's a physical therapist out in the- That's cool that he also went Samoa. into the- Yeah, he actually went into the medical field yeah. as well. And he's now um, working with the veterans out there. So I actually got to go and visit him three times. And the first time I went there, I told my cousin that was hosting us, can you drive me to the hospital? I wanna see what the hospital looks like. And so I get there and I just, my heart just dropped. I was wow. so disheartened by the look of it. It looks like old barracks. And I feel like um, there can be some improvement in the healthcare system there. And so whatever I can do to help um, do, you know, help them, I'm all for it. I just want to make sure I can collaborate with the right people out there when I do go out there so that we can help our own people. There's so much to do to help them. And I know that with my nursing skills and knowledge, I could probably help somewhere, somewhere. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time. You know, it's just, uh, <laughs> just talking stories, you Thanks know, and just, me. uh, after, you know, having this conversation, feeling inspired, you know, that, um, Another person that we talked to <laughs> with Leti Faitala, he told us, or in his podcast, he said, and he mentioned that all our, our you know, the God-given talents that we're given mm -hmm. is for other people, is to, to help, is for helping other people, and it's not for ourselves. And that's so true. And so I feel like the talents that you were given, you know, especially with nursing, mm -hmm. is here to help our own people. And it, it shows, you know, wanting to go back home or wanting to go back to Samoa and help the people in I the village there. I never lived there, but I've been there, and I'm <laughs> right. all for helping our people our community that's so, yes. awesome cool well is there anything else that you know any parting words that you want to say or anything else thank you so much for having me thank you for sharing your story and you know again thanks for tuning into this episode of the village made podcast from my village to yours it takes a village to raise a child <laughs>